Welcome to the EQFit Podcast. Our mission is to equip people to prosper in every aspect of their life. Whether you're at home or in the workplace, we explore practical ways of improving success, satisfaction, finding balance, and building enjoyable and beneficial relationships. Thank you for joining us. We are continuing our exploration of emotional intelligence, how it relates to soft skills, how it relates really to every part of our life. And today I want to focus in on self-regulation. Some people also call that self-management, but self-regulation refers to the ability to manage and direct your own feelings, thoughts, and actions towards achieving long-term goals. So not just reacting to something, but thinking about what's going to happen in the way that you go about responding to something so that you get a better outcome. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. The skill of self-regulation involves recognizing and controlling impulses, emotions, and behaviors, and controlling those in a way that it aligns with your personal values and with the the culture and the societal norms around you. So what is the difference between reaction and response or responding. It's easy to react to something. That's simple. But are the outcomes what we would want them to be? Usually, reaction is rapid and not very well thought through. That's not necessarily a bad thing when you're in a situation where the triggering of those emotions happens to save you from bodily harm. I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, And an example of that is you're not paying a lot of attention. You step off the sidewalk onto the street. There's a vehicle coming at you at high speed. That emotion kicks in of fear and just panic. And that gives you the energy to move out of the way. And that's great. Uh, but hopefully that doesn't happen every day. As we said, it's not necessarily a bad thing when we react in those situations. It's a natural part of our survival instincts. That fight, flight, freeze reaction, those are embedded in a part of our brain that houses our survival reactions. And that's good. I'm glad we have those things. We've all experienced times in our lives when emotions have kicked in uh, to limit harm to us, giving us the energy and the motivation to stay safe. In our world today, however, these reactions may not be the best response to everyday emotions. So rarely is fight, flight, or freeze a good thing today at home or at work, barring extreme circumstances. Responding to emotions that we feel is usually a better way to go. There is real science behind the old saying, count to 10 when you're mad. The science shows that a flood of emotions that happens when we experience something actually starts to clear the brain in about six seconds, allowing us to think more clearly, be more intentional with our choices. Now, that does not mean the emotions themselves completely go away, just that the intensity is reduced. This is why having strongly developed self-regulation is so important. When we talk about self-regulation, think of how you control those things like your behavior, your emotions, your thoughts, 
in different types of situations, different scenarios. And I want you to walk through that. Let's do a quick exercise. I want you to think back to the last time you were speaking to someone and you had a very strong emotion. Now, this could be anybody in your life, but I want you to think back, whether it was at home or at work, think back to that moment and then take the next step. What were you thinking during that conversation? What were you feeling during that conversation? And then what did you do? What action or reaction came out of that? Now take that and think about if you could go back and change something to get a better outcome, is there something you could change in that circumstance that would give you a better outcome? This is really a type of self-regulation. It's a way to use self-regulation to respond instead of react. A lot of times, and we've all been there, we will be in a situation and we get triggered and we either say or do something that we regret later. That regret can be every, anything from mild, gosh, I wish I hadn't done that, to, oh, I got to go fix this. This is, this is bad. Well, that's the difference between reacting and responding. Responding is taking the time to think through What is the outcome I would like to have come out of this situation? And that's why self-regulation is so important for our success and satisfaction in life. So let's dive a little deeper, first by defining what self-regulation is. Self-regulation is a critical component of emotional intelligence It encompasses the ability to understand and manage personal emotions and behaviors, respond appropriately to different situations, make decisions that consider future consequences rather than just immediate gratification. Now, I want to take that definition and give you an example through a story. This story is a personal story of mine when I had to practice self-regulation at a very high level. In my first leadership role, I was a sales manager for a medium-sized organization. I had the advantage of years of observing my father, the psychologist, consultant, and businessman, And I had that advantage of watching him and watching him deal with different people. Now, this gave me insight that most people don't have at the age that I was. I felt well prepared and equipped to be a leader. That feeling lasted about three days into my new job when I was a new sales leader. Then reality set in. One of the older salespeople far more experienced than I in the organization and in sales, decided to test my leadership. In my first sales meeting as a leader, he found fault with everything I was trying to express to my team. Nothing was up to his standards. This became very frustrating very quickly. I honestly thought to myself, I wonder if it would be acceptable if I fired this guy in the very first meeting. I mean, that's where my brain was at that point. Should I just terminate this guy on the spot? I had worked for days to prepare for this meeting. It was an opportunity to turn the poorest performing division in the entire organization around, and I was eager to get started. I did not expect this kind of pushback, especially in my very first meeting. I had a choice to make. 
I, if I fired the guy, it would probably set a specific tone, but was that the tone that I wanted to set at that point? I knew I had the authority because the vice president of sales told me to do whatever I thought I needed to, to make the needed changes, to turn things around. So I had a decision to make, and it had to be immediate. This was not something that you could just let lie and hope it would get better. There are consequences that have to be applied if accountability and and the health of the team is going to be kept at a higher level. And this is where a lot of organizations fall short is a lack of practicing accountability. And this kind of divisiveness cannot be allowed to continue. It creates toxicity. It can even create a hostile work environment. So I had to do something. Thankfully, I remembered one of my father's stories about a similar situation that he went through. So instead of pulling the guy out of the room and terminating him on the spot, I got up from my chair, walked over to him where he was sitting, and handed him my keys. He was stunned. Then he said, what are these for? And there was some real attitude in that. I told him that since he had decided to take over the meeting, maybe he should be the sales leader. Handing him my keys was symbolic of that. You could have heard a pin drop in that room. And that was when I said, oh, by the way, the VP of sales said this division has to be performing at goal within 90 days or the entire division will be shut down. Then I went back to my chair and sat down and practiced what I call golden silence. It's amazing what will happen when people experience silence in a critical moment. They feel the need to fill the silence because the silence is so uncomfortable. Well, the outcome of that meeting and that situation, the salesperson that was so disruptive tossed my keys on the table, gathered up his things, and left the meeting. The next day, he resigned. For me to be able to practice self-regulation at that level, I had to build up that skill ahead of time ahead of that situation. That is true of all emotional intelligence skills and really all soft skills. You can't just develop them on the spot. By creating that capacity ahead of time in emotional intelligence and soft skills, I was able to handle that situation far better than if I had just reacted. The more we can develop these skills, which enhance our internal resources like energy and focus, the more intentional we can be. That is the pathway to better decisions and actions that lead to better outcomes. Now let's focus on how self-regulation works. Self-regulation operates through several key processes. Number one, awareness. Recognizing your own emotions, your own thoughts, and your own behaviors. Now, the competencies of emotional intelligence that can be used there, the big category is self-awareness, but the emotional literacy competency is so important here because if you cannot identify the emotions and name them and know how they impact you, which is what emotional literacy is, then it's going to be very, very difficult to have the level of self-awareness that you need. Go back to the story 
that I just shared with you. I knew I was angry. I knew I was frustrated. I knew how those things could impact me. I knew my own patterns. And so I had to choose a different pathway. It would have been so easy to just look at that guy in that meeting and say, you're gone, pack up your stuff, no more, that's it. But I didn't do that because it would have impacted the entire team in a very specific way, which is not all bad, but the reality is I wanted a better outcome than that for the team. So I took a longer view. So number one in how self-regulation works is awareness. Number two is self-assessment. Evaluating these against long-term goals and values. So think about the goals and the standards that you hold your decisions up to. That's what I was going through during that, that story is I was considering different options and how I could best get the outcome that I really wanted to get, not just for myself, but for the entire team. So being able to evaluate your, what's going on with your emotions, your thoughts, your behaviors is really important and how they impact you. And if the decisions you're going to make are going to be good decisions for the long term, not just what gratifies you right now. The third element in how self-regulation works is control. So adjusting your actions and responses to align with the goals and the values. And that makes a lot of sense. So recognize your patterns, apply consequential thinking, that's running what-if scenarios, creating different options, and thinking about what the consequences of those options might be. And then when you do those things, you can better navigate the emotions you're having to get better outcomes. If you can navigate emotions in a way that you use that energy and, and information the emotion is giving you as a more strategic resource, you're going to get consistently better outcomes. So how do we develop self-regulation? I'm going to read a variety of things here that I found that I think are very helpful. The first one is mindfulness. And I know a lot of people think of mindfulness and they think, oh, that's some new age thing or whatever. No, it's, it's simply neuroscience. It's simply understanding your brain by practicing mindfulness, which increases your self-awareness and the awareness of your thoughts and your feelings. That's all it is. It's introspection. It's reflection on yourself and introspection at the same time. The second one, how we can develop self-regulation is goal setting. And I think this one is a very important element here. Clear, achievable goals provide direction for self-regulating efforts. If you don't have some clear, definable goals, it's going to be hard to have a good compass when you're in those situations. I knew what had to be achieved in that 90-day period of time. And I knew we didn't have a lot of time to do things that were non-productive. And so I chose the best path forward so that we could get the results that we needed. And by the way, and I was going to share this at the end, but I'll share it now. That division went from the last division in the entire organization to the top division in 12 months. And yes, some of that was me and my leadership, but it was more about the team pulling together and setting a goal and achieving that goal together. And, and the collaboration and the community that happened because of that was, was just amazing. So you know, there is a very happy ending to that story. What's the next thing in developing self-regulation? It's self-monitoring. 
Keeping track of behaviors and emotions helps in understanding triggers and patterns. Very important. Recognizing your patterns and what triggers those patterns. Recognizing situations where when you're triggered, you tend to react instead of respond. This is self-monitoring. The more you do that, you create greater self-awareness, and that just enhances your ability to self-regulate. The fourth element here in developing self-regulation is delaying gratification. Learning to wait for more significant rewards builds self-control. I got to be honest with you, I really wanted to fire that guy in that meeting. I wanted to do it in front of everybody. I mean, I just, I was triggered. I was defensive. I was frustrated. I was angry. And I just wanted to terminate him. But I knew you just get that feeling inside of yourself that goes, okay, that's, it's not right. This is not right. I need to think long term. I need to think better outcomes. Because that moment of gratification may have unintended consequences. And number five in developing self-regulation, stress management. And this is really important. Reducing stress levels aids in better emotional and impulse control. And I know we've all been there. When we're tired, when we're stressed out, when we're hungry, I mean, or hangry, as some people say, the reality is we can make decisions and do things that we're not real proud of later. And so reducing stress is important. It's important overall. It's very important when it comes to self-regulation. It's very difficult to think about options and consequences and all of that and recognizing our patterns and what emotions are doing to us right now if we are so stressed that we don't have the resources to process that. And the last one in developing self-regulation is reflection, which is regular reflection on actions and their outcomes. Uh, That can really improve future self-regulation. It's almost like we learn something by going through something and then we reflect on it and we, we eliminate the things that didn't go the way we want or that were negative or had bad outcomes. And we, we lock in the things that were positive. So let me kind of bring this together and close it out with a thought process. Think of these emotional intelligence skills as tools in a toolbox. The more that you practice with them, the greater the skill that you're going to develop. Now, why is this important? Would you like to improve in any of the following areas? Relationships, your effectiveness, your sense of well-being, the balance that you have in your life, your ability to focus, your energy levels, your leadership, your decision-making, your problem-solving, your critical thinking, how agile you are, how resilient you are, your ability to connect well with other people, your ability to build trust. If you want to improve any of those areas, and these are just a few of the areas that can be enhanced, by developing self-regulation. Putting this skill into practice is the path to achieving the outcomes that you really desire. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you have any questions about this week's episode or maybe a suggestion for future episodes you'd like us to explore, please contact us through our website at eqfit.com. For more information and inspiration, connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at EQFit.